Okay, so my name is Peter. Uh, I'm from Sweden, uh, and I built a tool called SiteSpeed.io, and I work for the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, so you know a little bit about Sweden, right? People on stocking. We have Greta Thunberg, a couple of great people. Uh, but there's something that you don't know, I think, and that is like Sweden and France, we are like best friends. Do you know? No? Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to show you. So the guy to the right is the Swedish king, Carl Gustav. He's shouting. Uh, she's the queen, Sylvia. Um, the thing is, the Swedish king is actually from France. His grand, 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 grandfather was from France. So, uh, many, many years ago, we lost a lot of wars. We tried to beat Russia, it didn't go well. Um, uh, we had a king with no children. So, what should we do? I mean, uh, we need to find a new way to, to have a new king. So we went to the best country in the world, you know, the greatest country in the world, France. So, we found Napoleon Bonaparte and asked him, do you have any brothers or any sisters that could come and become uh, king or queen of Sweden? Like, like you can be like the, um, the king of the north. That would be like super great. Uh, but he said no. So we were really disappointed. But then there was one guy that ac actually asked one of the generals of Napoleon called Sean Bernadotte and said that, oh, so we have um, no money in Sweden. If you pay us a little bit of money, you will be the king of Sweden. Yeah, the king of Sweden, right? So, uh, now we have a king that are from France, and Sweden and France are like best friends. So, uh, one thing you need to know about Sweden is that we are very, very shy. So, if I ask a question uh, at a conference in, in Sweden, you will never get an answer. But today I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and I hope that you can show me that you are better uh, at answering questions. Yeah, so did you notice there's one like really strange thing about this picture? Do you see it? No? Okay. Do you see it now? No? Do you see it now? <laughs> yeah, so one of the soldiers actually looked like me. It's really strange. So I think we have a special bond between Sweden and, and France. So now we're going to talk about performance. Um, uh, I'm going to briefly talk about our setup, what we do at the Wikimedia Foundation, how we are trying to keep Wikipedia fast. Uh, I'm going to focus on uh, the learnings I've got from the four years I've been working, more of practical things that I think uh, are good for people that set up things themselves, or if you use a provider. Uh, it's those things that I haven't thought about before I joined the foundation. And then uh, I also wanted to have uh, go through a case study of uh, regression and how we found it and what we do. Um, this is the performance team. We are four people at the moment. It's uh, Aaron, Gil, that is talking in the other room, uh, Timo and me. We do different things. Uh, I try to focus on synthetic testing, a little bit of RAM testing. Uh, Timo and uh, Jill are all over the place. They know everything. Uh, Aaron are doing mostly backend things. Um, but we work pretty good as a team. Everything we do is open. Every code we write is open source. Uh, we, have a, we use Fabricator uh, as an issue tracker that is also open. So uh, after this, uh, talk when you have time. You can go to fabricator.wikimedia.org and then search for the Wiki, uh, performance team and you can see what we are doing right now and what we want to do and you can follow us, what we do. Uh, we also have our performance graph, oh sorry, Brian. our performance graph uh, open. So you can go to grafana.wikimedia.org where you can see uh, what we are measuring and how we are measuring things. Everything is open. Uh, you can go there and you can search for uh, navigation timing, for example, or um, uh, web page replay or web page test, and you can see uh, our dashboard. Um, but why is performance important to us? 
Yeah, so we want to bring free knowledge to the world, independent of where you live and what kind of economic status you have. Um, that is important because in some parts of the world, uh, you have a really poor internet connection, but we want to make sure that even though if you have that, you can still read Wikipedia, right? Um, since we are quite large, a small change can mean a lot. So this is a, a couple of year old tweet uh, where we try to hire more people to the team. So uh, by just decreasing uh, the time of loading uh, pages, one, 100 milliseconds, we will save years and years and years of reading time for our users. So it's really important. Um, so we want to share the knowledge. We want to make sure that you don't spend too much time to read it. And there's also super uh, important for engineers and developers uh, to know if we're doing better or, or if we're doing worse. Because I see performance as a thing of, people talk about, yeah, we will make more money. But it's also a thing for me as a developer to know if the things I push are good or not. Uh, so that's really important. Um, but why is performance hard for us? So uh, last week, or yeah, I think it was last week, we had a DDoS attack. And there were people saying things like this. Wikipedia is quite easy, right? So you just have the SQL database. You can just read the data and you just put it in a template. And it's super easy to have things fast because everything scales. It's true in a way. Uh, Wikipedia is quite simple. It's data and we just show it, right? Um, the thing is, have you heard about the golden rule of web performance? Anyone? Yeah, I see. So the golden rule is that uh, the time spent for a user uh, when you're visiting a page uh, or rendering a page is mostly in the front end. So this is an example. The yellow uh, is time spent on uh, Wikipedia on one of the pages uh, where it's like 93% time spent in front end and 7% spent in back end. So even though if we have a really fast back end, uh, front end is important. And the thing for us is like this. So we have different wikis all over the world. We have an English wiki, we have a French wiki. These wikis can have different setups, meaning they can have different JavaScript, they can have different CSS as a base. Uh, all pages uh, can also have different JavaScript and different CSS. That means it's kind of hard to cache everything. So dependent on what you as author adds to the page, you can have different CSS, you can have different JavaScript. And then, when you visit Wikipedia, if you're a user, you can also add your own JavaScript and your own CSS to every page view. So it's hard for us as a performance team to actually know, to, to make sure that we have a, um, cached content everywhere. Um, we started out four or five years ago uh, with uh, our performance team. But before that, uh, people spent a lot of time uh, making our product, the media wiki, uh, the wiki that runs uh, Wikipedia fast on the PHP side. So we run PHP. Uh, uh, and then we started to add simple RAM data from real users with the navigation timing API. And after that, we started to add some synthetic testing to try to capture the whole area of how things is going. Uh, RAM. So RAM is metrics from real users. Do anyone here use RAM data? Anyone? So I, I don't feel that it's almost the same as in Sweden now. So can we try one more time? Do anyone use RAM data? Yeah, a couple more, yeah, good. Yeah, so we use RAM, uh, and that's how we started to measure performance in uh, at Wikipedia. Um, we sample uh, the data because we get a lot of page use, uh, and at, when we started, we didn't know if we can take care of everything, um, if we would overload uh, where we store the data and so on. Uh, so we sample it. Uh, one out of 100 requests right now. We want to uh, increase it, but right now it's like that. Um, the problem with user data is that you get so much. Like, and how do you know what kind of 
uh, platform and browser people are using. So we, we sample data, one out of 100. Uh, we have a lot of traffic from US, for example. So the samples get a little bit screwed. So at, when we have a lot of traffic from US, we get a lot of samples from US. Um, the way we, that we try to handle that today, we don't handle it, uh, but we, we try to put the data in different buckets. So we have a bucket of the platform, or the user coming from desktop, or, or the user coming from mobile. Uh, we have different browsers, and we, have, uh, we also store the browser versions, because we're gonna talk about that later, it's important. And then lo location, from where the user is access accessing Wikipedia. Uh, we have our own uh, navigation timing plugin that we have built, that is open source, that you can look at, at GitHub. Uh, and also, we also have the different uh, dashboards that can look like this. So uh, this is navigation timing data from mostly from Chrome, first paint. Uh, if you look to the right, we, we collect, th this is like data from mobile users all over the world. Uh, it's sample data, but it's like all the data that we collect. Uh, this is the 75 percentile. So 75% of the users are faster than this metric. Uh, if you look to the right, you can see that it looks like maybe it's increasing. Uh, and one of the tricks that we do, uh, that Timo in our team always do to every dashboard, is that we compare with one week back. So if you look at this dashboard, I think it's much easier to see that uh, we have some kind of things that's going on, that the first paint has increased for mobile users. Um, what's kind of cool is that even though that we have uh, 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 data from all the users, a, a large bucket, uh, we can still, <laughs> we, we still push things uh, where we have a regression that we can see it in RAM data. So it, this is probably quite uh, large because it's affect a lot of users, right? We, uh, that's kind of, kind of a bad thing. Um, another thing that we also collect, we, we have the first paint, we collect load event end, we collect the navigation timing data. But as I said, we also collect uh, um, which browsers, and we also, collect, uh, we also have a, a graph of uh, report rate. So usually when, when you get a bug, or when you have a regression, uh, it can either be the tools that we use to measure, is there something wrong there, can we have the, the push that breaks things, or do, um, is it actually a regression in the code that we have pushed? So by pushing, to, to, um, pushing uh, the rate of events or report we get from different browsers, we can see things, we have seen uh, bugs that, for example, a browser uh, uh, stopped reporting data, or we pushed a change to our uh, code, where we measure the navigation timing, uh, where we miss some browsers. So keeping track of the report rate is like one of the main things that we do uh, to make sure that the data we collect is okay. Um, yeah, how we use RAM. We collect from all users, all scenarios. Uh, as I said, we, we get the platform, uh, mobile, but if you use Wikipedia, you know that every page is different. We have article pages, but we also have user pages, but right now, we all throw them in the same bucket. So it's kind of hard to know if you have a problem, is it affecting everyone, or if we have a, like a small regression somewhere, we probably aren't noticing that with RAM. Um, right now we are focusing on the 75 percentile uh, to make sure that um, we can keep track on that. We also measure 95 and 99, but we have some kind of dirty data, so the 99 percentile can sometimes be um, really high or wrong. Um, we use the RAM data to alert on regressions. So with the dashboards that we have, we also have alerts where we compare with what happened like a week back in time. So if the, there's are more than X percent or more than X uh, milliseconds change since last week, we get an alert. In our team right now, we, we get an email saying that something is wrong. 
and then we need to go in and, and uh, try to understand what's not working. Um, yeah, we collect first paint and load event end and all navigation timing. The thing is with RAM data, it's really good to use it together with synthetic testing. So when we only had RAM data, it was good because we, we could find some regressions, but it was really hard to understand what's going on if you don't have the synthetic testing. Uh, what's good about RAM data is that it's from real users, so we know that we somehow are affecting people, right? If you use synthetic, it could be that it's only affecting our own synthetic test and not real users. Uh, like every company or organization in the world, we are use web based test. We started to use it four or five years ago, uh, where we just keep it running for a couple of URLs uh, and we measure it uh, every hour uh, and collect the data. We mainly focus on, on visual metrics, like first visual change. Uh, first visual change is good for us because we know if first visual change uh, changes, something is wrong because uh, we, don't, uh, we render everything on the page with just HTML and CSS. JavaScript is only adds on. So if something happens with the first visual change, we know that someone has pushed a change that we need to look into. Uh, if we are using speed index, for example, um, I don't know if you have seen that we sometimes have banners on Wikipedia where we ask people to help us to pay. Uh, and that banner actually pushes down content, so our speed index changes. Um, we have a way of, of knowing that because we also add the user timing when we push a banner so we can have rules in our alert system that if we have the user timing of a, um, of a banner, uh, the speed index will change. Uh, but we mainly focus on first visual change because in RAM testing or from real users, we have the first paint that in our world for Wikipedia is almost almost the same as first visual change. So the synthetic testing and the RAM testing works fine to, uh, together. We also use browser time, uh, one of the tools I've built, and together with web page replay. Web page replay is a replay proxy. Um, do we have anyone that has used a replay proxy? No. Uh, a replay proxy works like this. Uh, you turn on the proxy, you tell your browser to talk to the proxy, you access a page, the proxy will record everything on that page, every request, and then you turn off the proxy and then you put it into a replay mode and then you point the browser to the proxy and it will replay everything. So in that way we will uh, get rid of the latency uh, of the internet and the server response time. So we'll only, when we do our testing, our browsers only ta talks to uh, the proxy. And that way, we are trying to measure just uh, front-end performance and get rid of everything else. This works really good for us since we don't have any ads. So the content on our pages are the same almost all the time. Uh, we pushed this, I think, two years ago because we want to have flat metrics, like a flat line. Uh, this isn't flat, but if you look at the numbers we have there, uh, it isn't, so, um, it isn't su such a big difference. Uh, this is for one of the pages that we measure, uh, uh, the first visual change. So the idea is that we want to have really stable metrics with the synthetic testing because our RAM metrics is going up and down depending on the day uh, and on the hour and from where in the world people are, are using Wikipedia. Uh, with the synthetic testing, we want to make sure that we have a really flat line. Uh, we do that by trying to configure the servers that run the synthetic testing uh, uh, to be good. We do that by testing a URL X amount of times, uh, and then we take the median run and, and uh, look at that. Um, the best thing that we, uh, or that uh, uh, I've been using to, to know if we are doing good with our synthetic testing, so if I didn't, didn't mention synthetic testing, if you don't know, I, I is uh, finding, starting a browser uh, on a computer somewhere in the world and testing your website. Deviation. So we measure deviation when we do our testing because deviation can help us to see if the pages we are testing are uh, giving us different results or if something is wrong on the server, we run the tests. 
So if you run uh, five runs or 11 runs or 10 runs, uh, we always uh, get the deviation to, to see what kind of um, deviation we have within the metrics. If you change the browser, it can happen that the deviation uh, increases from browser versions, or if something happens on the server. So it's a way for us to make sure that uh, the metrics we get is okay. Uh, with synthetic, we are trying to fixing the chaos, right? Because for RAM data, we have different uh, uh, numbers all, all the time. Uh, but it's also like synthetic testing is, is cost, uh, cost a little bit. Uh, we need to choose a couple of URLs because we cannot run, or at least we have a limited budget, so we just want to run uh, a couple of tests. So in our, uh, how we use it is that we use uh, three URLs per wiki at the moment. And we know that we have like a base JavaScript and CSS uh, for each wiki. And if all three URLs uh, have a change, uh, then we will fire an alert. So it could be that uh, one editor of, of Wikipedia uh, adds something on one page and one of the metrics goes up really high but we don't alert on that because uh, uh, that's a normal fluctuation of what can happen. We, we can have, it can go up and go down for just one page because it depends on what kind of content we have on that page. But if all three URLs uh, change, we fire an alert. Um, we use synthetic testing as a wayback machine. Uh, that, I, I think we, we don't talk about that so much, but that's the best thing. Uh, with the synthetic testing, we know what the page looked like at uh, at uh, um, at at the timing. So we we store the screenshots, we store the full uh, uh, the video or uh, um, or the film strip. We store the HTML at the moment uh, uh, where we did the testing, um, so that when you get the regression, you want to compare what hap how what things looked like before. Because finding, um, when you have a regression, you need to try to find uh, what's working uh, or what has changed. And in our scenario, at least, that can be really hard. Uh, but keeping, like, having images, having an, the HTML uh, makes things easier. I'm going to talk about that later. Um, we also focused, as I said before, almost only on first visual change at the moment. We, we have a lot of other metrics, but we, we try to focus on that because that's the only metric that we know that if something fails, if the metrics goes up, we have done something wrong. And of course, it's also best friends with RUM. So together with the RUM data and the uh, synthetic testing, we can find regressions. So learnings. Uh, the first and important one of the most important things is validate metrics. So uh, all the tools that we have used um, and all the tools I've used before when I joined the foundation uh, have some kind of bugs that happens now and then. So this is the start rendering time. You can see yeah, it's like 300 milliseconds, but sometimes it goes down to 33 milliseconds. And is that, if that happens, you need to find out what's wrong, right? So that's why it's important to, uh, to have screenshots. So this is a bug that was a couple of years ago or something like that. So most of the tools that use a video uh, use visual metrics to measure uh, when the, uh, to get the, the metrics like uh, first visual change. And you can see there that uh, visual metrics uses an orange frame to know when you go from uh, when you start the browser and when you uh, go to the first page. So here is something wrong in the tool, that uh, you, the, fur, the little orange thing is actually from the tool and, uh, and is not affecting, should not affect uh, the data we have. Uh, and it's also like in Chrome, and Chrome on mobile, if you see that l line there, the information line on, on uh, which assets that are loading, Chrome changes over time, and tools try to keep up, but it happened that we pick up that small little line that doesn't matter to the user or to our metrics, but it can change first visual change or it can change uh, last visual change. So it's important to, to be able to, uh, when you have strange metrics, you want to look at the pages and look at the measurements and see what's wrong. 
page one isn't the same as page two. Uh, so when we t test on different wikis, uh, we have the same content almost in different languages. Uh, but as I said, we have different JavaScript on different wikis. So this is a deviation uh, on uh, two different wikis where we almost uh, test uh, the same pages. Not all, but... But you can see that the deviation on one wiki is really small. So there we know that we don't need to do so many runs when we do our synthetic testing. But on the other wiki, uh, even though that we try to have the, like the best tools and uh, set up the server the best way, uh, the deviation is really much higher. So there we know that we need to, uh, to get some confidence in our metrics. We need to do more runs. Um, but it's also like, for us, I don't know how it is for others, but uh, when we do testing, uh, pages act differently. So this is a, a screenshot or a film strip of where we, uh, a small user journey, we access one page and then we go to another page and we measure that second page. Because uh, users as Wikipedia uh, access multiple pages, right? So they have a kind of a user journey uh, we mostly focus on, on cold cache, when you access one page uh, with nothing in the cache. But we have started to measure also like multiple pages. So in this example, uh, you visit the one page uh, and then uh, you go to the Facebook page, one of the golden pages that we measure. And you can see that the first visual change happened almost at one second, uh, even though that we have some things in our cache. Uh, when we look at another page where we do the exactly same thing, but dependent on what JavaScript we have on that page, uh, you can see that we start render on 0 0.1 seconds. So dependent on which pages the user has visited before, we have a, a big difference on, on uh, the start rendering. So it's, it's important to understand that, uh, that um, uh, pages have different uh, characteristics, I don't know how we say it in English, pages can be different. Uh, so uh, with RAM data, we are capturing that, but we aren't capturing which page the actual user is visiting. So we just put it in a big bucket. With uh, the synthetic testing, we can actually see the difference. So we can help developers to say, yeah, but if you look here, what kind of JavaScript are we loading here and what can we do better? Uh, server matters when you do synthetic testing. Uh, so when we started to uh, use the WebPage replay proxy to try to have the, like, the most stable metrics, we tr tried out uh, a lot of different cloud providers to make sure that the metrics are as stable as possible. So we just put up a server, uh, uh, we ran the same tests for a while and collected the metrics and then looked uh, at it over time to see how it was doing. And we also tried uh, on bare metal, on our own servers, to try to get as stable metrics as possible. Uh, for us, maybe it isn't the same for you, but AWS gave us the, much, uh, the m most stable metrics uh, with all the different uh, providers that we tested. And it was like a big, big difference. With AWS, we can have, yeah, we can feel secure with the metrics that we get, but with some of the other cloud providers, um, it was going up and down, so uh, so we couldn't feel confident with the metrics that we get. Uh, another thing that happens if you run, so usually we, we deploy our tests on one server and then we just keep it running for as long as possible, like days, weeks, months, years. Uh, and sometimes you get a regression that you cannot find or understand why. And that has been a couple of times that uh, the actual cloud server that we're using has, um, has a degradation of performance. So uh, since um, they are actually running other things on the same physical servers, uh, uh, performance can change over time with our measurements. And the last thing that's important, so for example, if you use AWS, if you have an instance and you have an instance type yet that you are using, uh, you will get different performance uh, on different instances of the same type. So uh, there's a great talk from uh, Netflix about that. 
Netflix do like this. When they spin up a new AWS server, they spin up three, and then they run a performance test on them and see which server that are fastest, and then they use it. And they say they can have like a 30% difference uh, on the servers of, of performance. And if, of course, if a server is 30% faster than another server, uh, that will impact how you run your JavaScript and the metrics you will get. So that's really important. So I did a test uh, some time ago, uh, a couple of years ago maybe, where I deployed the same code uh, on a couple of different, uh, on AWS, on the same instant type. Uh, and the thing that we can see was that we get a little bit uh, uh, difference of deviation. So different servers on the same cloud provider can give us different uh, deviation. So we, at that moment, we chose the one with the uh, lowest deviation. And you can see uh, some of the servers, or one server, wasn't. Uh, it, it's a little bit hard to see, but it wasn't acting as good as the rest. So it's important. Uh, right now, we don't do any automatic testing uh, with the servers when we deploy a new one. Um, but maybe that's something that we should do. And there's the original task and fabricator, if you want to look it up later. Uh, yeah, so we had the testing of where we tested a user journey. We only test a simple user journey at right now. Uh, we also want to test like editing a page and so on in the synthetic testing. But testing multiple steps are hard because uh, you, in, in one way you want to test what the users actually are doing, like trying to, to do the same as, as your user is doing. So you need to know like what's, it, what's the average time spent on a page before you move on. And that also relates to how long do your browsers keep the HTTP connection open? Because if they close the connection between uh, in your user journey, um, it will have very different performance char characteristics. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's important. Uh, we don't. I, I don't have a good answer on that. I. I um, when I implement something new, I just try to test it and test it in different behaviors and try to have different wait times to see uh, what happens. Uh, browser versions also matters when you do synthetic testing. So we have found a couple of uh, bugs or performance bugs in Chrome when we're updating to newer versions. And what's important for us is that when we roll, on, uh, and roll out a new version, uh, we need to know it. So we have some tools that automatically updates the Chrome version or Firefox version. Uh, and when it does, uh, I try to go through the backlog and see when that change happened and add uh, a tag uh, in our uh, dashboard so we know when it happened. With some tools, uh, we, just, we just change the version and then roll it, up, roll it out. So this is an example when we updated the uh, Chrome 69 where we found uh, uh, regression. And what's good then, if you have a tool where you can roll back the Chrome version, we rolled it back so we can create a, uh, uh, issue at, uh, for Chrome, and then we can uh, roll back and roll forward the actual Chrome version because this was like a uh, performance bug in Chrome. So it's really good to to understand that Chrome versions, or Chrome or Firefox or other browser versions, uh, differ because they do stuff every time, and knowing what version you are testing on is really important. I think. Yeah. So we have a couple of learnings from RAM. Uh, this is like the last, uh, this is from uh, uh, last week. We had a regression that we found in RAM. So we were pushing like a new thing uh, where we uh, uh, decreased the number of uh, JavaScript that we send in the first, uh, uh, first push we do. And when we pushed it uh, and looked at the graph, yeah, you see the the yellow one is the uh, one uh, one week back, and the line there is when we actually did the uh, push to production. So we introduced some kind of regression. The thing was that uh, we don't know what it was right now, but we know that it was something else than, than the change that we actually did. Uh, but what's cool about it is that we actually could see it in, in, in our RAM metrics. We didn't see it in our testing that we did before, but when we push it to the user, we can see it. Uh, yeah, this is an old one, but a lot of people in, in a couple of years ago said that the user timing API was super good. 
to show things. Uh, so this is how we using the, the best case of, of user timing that you fired when the image is shown in JavaScript. Uh, so the line you see, here, you see there is when JavaScript says that the image is shown, but you see at the top it differs like uh, almost three seconds. So uh, if you measure things in JavaScript, it's the same as what happens on the screen. It's important to know. But in Chrome, there are coming better things. Uh, we did a test with the new element timings where it actually matches the synthetic testing that we do. This has been released, but it's only for Chrome. So you can measure when uh, your images are actually shown on screen. Uh, yeah, here are also browser versions are important. So when Chrome roll out a new version, they usually roll it out like uh, small in the beginning and then they try to increase it when they see everything works. So here we try to, here we visualize different Chrome versions on mobile and desktop for our users. Uh, and that helps us to see things that isn't super easy to see in this graph, but we have a regression there. Um, and we can correlate that to when most of the users turn out to an, uh, a new Chrome version. And then we had the hidden tab incident, another RUM uh, thing, that uh, the idea was that our team uh, wanted to async all the JavaScript that we should do, of course, and we used uh, set timeout to execute some JavaScript later on perfectly fine, and we pushed it. And our users that had the worst first paint increased a lot. You see the uh, 99 percentile went from uh, maybe 11 seconds to 1.5 minutes. So something is wrong. Uh, the thing is that we didn't know, uh, Timo in our team uh, fixed it, uh, is that a lot of users open Wikipedia in another tab. So uh, if you use set timeout, the browser uh, down prioritize uh, that a lot. So uh, when we introduced that and people open a lot of tabs, uh, our metrics went up. So now we, uh, we make sure that we don't measure things that are open in other tabs than uh, aren't uh, for a user. Yeah. Okay, so what are we missing? Yeah, we are missing the king. But, uh, so for RAM, yeah, we want to have a higher sample rate, right? Because we miss out on a lot of things today. Uh, we want to have buckets per page type uh, in a way so we know better when we have a regression where we have the regression. We don't know that today with RAM. And Jill has done a study on trying to find out which metric are important to users. So if you go to uh, search for Jill and Wikipedia, you will probably see one of his talks about it because I studied, studied that a lot. Um, because today we don't know which metrics that are important. For synthetic testing, we have uh, real mobile phones that we want to do. We only test on servers right now and emulate on mobile, so that kind of sucks. We have a task for that. We have everything prepared, but we haven't started yet. The most, the hardest thing for us is to find a place to actually have the phones. Uh, and right now, the performance team is the team that take care of all the synthetic testing, but we want to make it easy for uh, developers to add their own tests. So we have that up and running, but we haven't gone live with it yet. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to briefly go through uh, an incident just a couple of weeks ago that I think is interesting. So we measure uh, synthetic testing on Firefox and on Chrome. So we get an alert, an email, and that we, I said that we focus on fi uh, first visual change, but we actually also uh, measure speed index. So we get an alert on speed index. So you can see we measure three different URLs, Barack Obama, Facebook, and uh, Sweden. And then you can see that our metrics just rised. Um, and we can also see that it rised on first visual change. And then we know that, oh, now, this is something that we need to look into because we know that first visual change shouldn't change. So someone has done something, right? Uh, then we looked at Chrome, uh, but we couldn't see any change there, there at all. Uh, so that kind of sucks. So it must be something with Firefox or something like that. Um, what's good, what we do today is that we also, I don't know if you see the green uh, line there, when we do a push to production, we also push uh, the data so we know. So we can see that it somehow correlated 
when we did the push, uh, our metrics went up. Um, we can also, th this was with the WebPage replay test that we're running, but we can also see the same thing for Firefox in our WebPage tests. tests. So we know that something is really wrong. We need to look into it. Uh, we have a server admin log where we write down everything that we push to production. Uh, it's a little bit small, but it's kind, kind of hard to know uh, what goes out. Uh, we also have like one train each week where we push everything that hasn't gone out, that goes out the normal way. So we have a long, long list of things that go, are going out. So when we find a regression, we try to pinpoint what commit or what change uh, did the uh, regression. Normally, if we get a uh, first visual change, it could be that something is wrong with the time to first byte. We have different data centers. We could have moved to another data center. So it's maybe not the real regression. But in this case, uh, we can see it with web page replay where we try to remove the uh, latency and, and time to first byte. So it was a real regression. But then things started to happen. We had the regression, but then it went back to normal on one of the URLs. And on another URL, it happens, but in uh, a different time span, it went back to normal. But then we had the regression, but it stayed there. So we had the regression, it was there. Uh, it was there for a while, and for some URLs it changed, and some URLs it didn't change. So what we do there, uh, we try to look at the images. We couldn't see anything in the screenshots, but we, we use uh, compare.sitespeed.io to compare HAR files from before and after, and just to, to understand what has changed, to see have we updated, um, do we push more JavaScript or more HTML or what happens? Um, so in this case, we can see that the HTML increased just with that release. Uh, we couldn't see anything uh, in our backlog, but when we, uh, since we have used it as a Wayback Machine, we can get the HTML before and the HTML that we have uh, after. And then we just compare the HTML. And you see there's a, like a span there uh, that for a couple of pages, it was 311 span classes that are for editors to see that there's a citation that uh, is wrong or missing. Uh, the span or the, or, and the div isn't shown for ordinary readers. But for uh, Firefox, uh, that change, uh, even though that it isn't visible, uh, increased the first vision change. And people started to uh, fix those things. So uh, that's why the uh, first vision change went down for some pages, uh, but not for all. Uh, yeah. So I think I'm, I'm fin finished. So questions? Thank you. Questions? Uh, are you using the Wayback Machine only for one happening today, or you store them all together? Yeah, so we store everything on S3. So we, we store for everything right now. Yeah. Yeah, but we use it for web page test and for browser time. So we just collect, in the HAR file, we also collect the HTML. And then also, of course, we had a screenshot. But we have, so in the beginning when we set everything up, we store everything for one year, but we never use data for one year. So we all, always try to store it now for like two weeks, because when we find a regression, we need to act on it immediately. So, and we dump it to S3, and then we just remove it when we don't use it. Yeah. May? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you uh, showed the slide uh, with uh, comparing two uh, two states of the page when it is called run and the second view. So first first view and the second view. So V8 uh, right now uh, caching uh, with three st strategies: uh, cold run, hot, uh, uh, warm, and hot run. So have you tried to? Uh, to, to do a third, uh, third run of the page and to see results. Yeah, so uh, actually I, I didn't explain it too good then because we are testing different pages. So you go to one page and then we are going to another page. Uh, so, uh, and and the, the difference in numbers we see depends on what kind of JavaScript the next page is loading. So some pages add some extra JavaScript and there we have the longer, uh, even though that our pages aren't depending on JavaScript to to render page, 
uh, we have also more CSS, so we need to download the extra CSS to render the page. Uh, so that's the, like the main thing. Uh, so it, um, it's more of it, it's more simple, I think. That that is more that we actually load more thing, things on some pages, and that's why we have the difference. Uh, it, it's not it's not a repeat view; it's a second view. Yeah, it's okay. a second. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a second view. It's another page. It's more of trying to. So usually, as a user, we have the, that you go down the Wikipedia hole, that you start on one page and then go to the next, the next, the next, the next. Uh, we want to measure more, but uh, we need to take it one step at a time. This was just an example to see that for us to understand that different pages have different behavior and gives us different metrics. <laughs>